Hey folks, welcome to Disgruntled for this week. Uh, today we are going to have a great conversation. Uh, Jason and I are here with you, uh, but we also have a very special guest. I'm not going to tell you who it is yet uh, because this guy is super famous and super important. Uh, so we will wait until it is his time to, uh, to jump into the fray. Uh, the conversation we're going to have today is centered around uh, VA accredited attorneys and why it might be a good idea for veterans who are struggling to either get approved or find benefits uh, through the government system. Uh, you know, we all know that you start out going to your county veteran service officer or something like that. Uh, and then if you get denied, well, you know, we did the best we can for you. Uh, if things change, come on back and, and we'll talk about it. Um, so let's bring in Jason and we'll also bring in uh, our good friend, Ben Krause. There they are. Hello, fellas. How are you? Very, <laughs> very <laughs> they're, they're very <laughs> eager to talk today. <laughs> Try to be so nice to Ben. So he just goes uh, radio silent. <laughs> yeah. So here we are. Nice. Can't thank you guys enough for your time. <laughs> It's worth every penny, man. seriously. <laughs> uh, um, okay, so um, <laughs> folks, uh, Ben Krause is here with us. Ben is a VA accredited attorney, uh, and he is he focuses around issues uh, veterans have with getting benefits and also um, some kind of vocational rehab and education stuff. Uh, but Ben, I don't want to speak for you because I'll probably get it wrong. Uh, so just talk to us a little bit about what you do, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I do, uh, first of all, a uh, veteran advocate for a long time, worked on uh, worked as an investigative journalist before I went to law school, and uh, then started working on veteran issues, not just benefits, but working on Freedom of Information Act requests, getting data from the government, and that has led into helping veterans with benefits, helping veterans with med mal cases and other types of investigations, um, helping Congress uh, better understand what's going on with the Department of Veterans Affairs and other agencies. A uh, big chunk of what I do every day and how I earn a living is helping veterans wrongly denied benefits become doctors and lawyers, business executives and other leaders in society. So I help veterans who are trying to basically get their education benefits paid for, uh, actually paid for when they're wrongly denied, big chunk of what I do, and also helping veterans with their disability benefits and uh, when they're denied benefits, trying to make sure that the uh, agency pays them what they're owed. That's a big plate. Yeah, it is. <laughs> That's a big plate. Well, thank you for your work. Um, Jason, do you have anything to add? Well, I don't know how I can add to Ben's pedigree, but... You know, I've got questions. Oh, um, okay. Well, I'd say more it's a conversation that, mm -hmm. you know, that Ben and I have, we've led our way down over over this last year. Uh, I didn't know half of what I needed to know as a veteran when it came to VA disability claims and what those issues truly look like. Um, I, I think the most alarming thing to me was how Ben explained to me how the system truly works. Um, like we all want to go to our CVSOs, we have to go through, we have to punch the, we have to punch the clock in a very particular way. We're told exactly how to do it. And then if there is no claim, then it, it's just over, you know, and that's the thing. And, and I think a lot of veterans hit that stumbling block where you, you, you're, you're finally done reaching out for help and, and you're just over it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's really what I learned. Um, there's folks out there like Ben and Ben being the shining example that we should all go to, to, to get that help that we need. Um, when we know that there's something that isn't quite right mm -hmm. and you never really know what you know until you know it. And, uh, um, you know, that, that's, that's your special sauce. That's that thing you can do. And, and I think if you could share with everybody just what that looks like, um, if you go in for a disability claim, and it's something that you don't feel that was adjudicated properly. You know, what, what can somebody expect when they go to BenjaminKrauseLaw.com to, uh, to have an interaction with you to find out what the steps are or what's going on? What, how does that look? Yeah, well, I mean, let me give you a little bit of background. So uh, I'm a disabled veteran and fought with the agency going from 10% to 100% permanent in total over the course of about 10 years. And actually longer than that. And I did not know at the time that I started my journey that the federal government might 
mislead or lie to an American, much less a uh, veteran, you know, after service and after you take off your uniform. And through my process of becoming more educated through the benefits that I was fortunate enough to get, uh, realized, again, that the agency uh, misled me personally about what it could and could not do, both with my education as well as my, my disability benefits. And uh, through that process of becoming educated and kicked in the teeth uh, repeatedly by the agency and the things that would go on there and the uh, other organizations that somewhat run interference for the agency, it just became apparent to me in that process that veterans don't understand what's going on. And most of us don't appreciate that the Department of Veterans Affairs is really just a big workers' comp insurance company that uh, is paid to essentially take care of uh, veterans similar to what workers' comp is for any employer. And it's an insurance company. It used to be called the Bureau of War Risk Insurance, and then they decided to change the name because apparently that was unpopular. Uh, and now we have the Department of Veterans Affairs, and here we are. Here we sit. And uh, Did you say the Bureau of War? War Risk Insurance. Never heard that before. Yep. No, me either. Interesting. Okay. So, yeah, it used to be called the Bureau of War Risk Insurance, and then it became the Veterans Administration, and then it became the Department of Veterans Affairs. But at one point in time, a veteran used to have a right to hire an attorney to go to court, take VA to court and district court in their area, and uh, sue when the agency was not paying them what they should have. And in the 30s, the powers that be decided that they didn't want veterans to be able to do that anymore. So they put us into this administrative system that is very similar to what we presently have in the Veterans Administration, where at the time, a veteran not only did you not have a right to hire an attorney, but you couldn't even sue. Uh, so you were stuck within what's called the uh, Board of Veterans Appeals, and you could only get representation at that time from a veteran service organization, not an attorney, in that context, unless, of course, an attorney was willing to uh, not eat food and, and work for free, which most attorneys don't. So most attorneys need to eat food, and most have kids and have houses, just like anyone else. And so they have to earn a living. And so it pushed attorneys out of the system, and the veterans were stuck with uh, VSOs. Now, a VSO does – the VSO in, environment and training is pretty good. It takes care of probably 60 to 70% of the issues because most of the issues are pretty straightforward. When you get into a more challenging situation, whether and it's really no different than building a special type of house or building a, a construction building versus building a house or something like that, uh, not every uh, carpenter, not every construction company, not every builder or developer does the same type of work. I wouldn't hire somebody who can build a house to build my apartment building or to build my, my uh, office complex or you know mini mall or whatever it is. Everyone has kind of a special niche. And so within that special niche and that kind of example, uh, VSOs have a unique opportunity to help veterans. Uh, veterans are not charged for that type of work and they will file initial claims and they can do some help with appeals work in this environment. Uh, they, they can't you know take your case to the Supreme Court, for example, or to the U.S. Court of Appeals for, at the Federal Circuit or to the U.S. Court of Appeals, uh, you know, anyway, I, I go on through the list. There are certain things that VSOs can do and certain things they can't do. Like a VSO can't help you with your divorce. They can't help you uh, with a real estate transaction. Uh, they can only help you when the federal government might owe you money. And in that context, a VSO is the really the only kind of game in town, for the most part, with some exceptions that will work on an initial claim. And by law, Congress has precluded a veteran from their right to hire an attorney. We're one of the only groups, if not the only group in the country, that does not have a right to hire an attorney whenever they want. So when mm -hmm. we took our uniform off, you could not hire an attorney to help you with your claim if you believe the government owed you money. Now, when you're in the, in the you know, army or whatever, you could hire an attorney for anything at that point, but the second you took your uniform off and, you know, for the last time, you could not hire an attorney anymore if you believe the government owed you money in compensation or any other type of claim initially. You could only hire an attorney after the federal government built a case against you and denied you or gave you less than what you should have received. Only then do you have the opportunity to hire a VA accredited attorney for support and assistance. So if I'm understanding you correctly... 
the men and women who are the purveyors of the proverbial blanket of freedom don't have the freedom to hire representation if they feel they need it. Until until you're denied something or they build a case against you for whatever reason. Right. It's kind of like uh, you're accused of a crime. You don't have the ability to hire an attorney to defend you. And instead, uh, you get a non-attorney to fill out the uh, I didn't do it paperwork. And then if the government you know, and the jury decide that you did it, well, then you can hire an attorney. It's kind of like that, except uh, when the government owes you money. And so in this context, uh, you can go to a VSO. Usually what they'll do, and I've, I've seen the paperwork that VSOs do across the country, so I'm familiar with how it works. And I've trained CVSOs uh, directly as an attorney about it. So I'm, I'm familiar enough to know the, the general uh, framework. So you go in to talk to them. They look at your record if they have access to it. They fill out the form, uh, and then they will put in the space of what type of claim you, you are claiming. They will put in the diagnosis that they think that you maybe should claim. Now, they're, they're not attorneys, and they're not doctors, so their ability to interpret that information within your medical record or within your service treatment records or whatever it is, uh, you know, is really dependent on whatever type of underlying training they have. There are some, I would say that you, most of them have some degree of college training then they are accredited through their uh, respective organization and then usually through a national VSO, and that's kind of how the accreditation works. I myself have my own accreditation because I went to an undergrad and then I went to law school, so that is seven years of my life, and then I passed the bar, which is a multi-day test uh, where you sit for many, many hours and you take the test to prove that you have the chops to handle that kind of pressure. And only then was able to become a VA accredited attorney after I applied and they did a background check in addition to all the other background checks I already had. And now I am VA accredited. Other people that go through that process usually become accredited through their organization in whatever kind of criteria that is. Usually it's a test of some kind, like a 25 to maybe 100 question test, and then that's, that's what they do. Uh, so it's kind of like going to the H&R Block to have your taxes done. And so H&R Block is not a tax attorney. Frequently, they're not an accountant, but they know more or less how to fill out paperwork and they can look at your tax documents and translate the numbers from one document to the other document. And then they hit go and it goes to the IRS. They know how to use TurboTax really well, basically. Uh, but yeah, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the deal is, you know, yeah. but I wouldn't go to them if I'm filing my taxes for my corporation or something complicated. Right, right. Because, uh, but I'll that, send my kids there who have been working at McDonald's for nine months. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But if it's a if it's a big boy kind of situation where I have you know hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, that's not who I want to use. You know. So taking that into the veteran camp, what you're dealing with there are the veterans that are uh, poly trauma or dealing with like multi injuries and like ID blast or somebody that's a, a paraplegic quadriplegic or they have a real complicated case. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that context, I think most people would agree that you're better off dealing with somebody or using a, a professional that has additional resources, for example, not only being uh, legally trained uh, like a lawyer, which is certainly not the same as being a VSO. Uh, and again, you know, not to say anything bad about VSOs, there are a lot of great VSOs that know a lot and they do well and they're really well intended. Uh, it's just not the same. You know? There are some that are slime bags, though. Well, uh, just like there are some slime bag attorneys, I, but, yeah. but you know, You're if right. I'm going to an auto mechanic and I need my oil changed, you know, maybe I go to Valvoline or something like that. Boom. I bang it out. But if I have a transmission problem, I don't go to Valvoline, you know, or I don't even go to my local mechanic. I go to a pro that does transmissions because that's, you know, What's, that's what complicated. Do. And if there's a mistake, it's going to cost thousands of dollars. So let me ask you this, um, because it's, <laughs> it seems goofy to me. Um, are there veterans, you mentioned polytrauma cases, are there veterans who are now quadriplegics or amputees or anything like that, uh, that the VA is saying, no, nah, I don't believe that the loss of your leg is due to your service. So we're not going to connect that. I've, I've heard of examples where there have been errors like that. 
Uh, I think, you know, in most instances where they have a service treatment record that on its face, you know, shows that you, you went into military with both legs, you came out missing yeah. a leg, you know, hopefully they hard to miss make that. a mistake. There could be a situation where they rate that person lower than they should otherwise receive, you know, and maybe there's some secondary uh, conditions that are tied to whatever that amputation could be. You know, so I guess an example might be a person that gets an amputation uh, and, and so they have the one leg, the one leg, you know, receives, let's say, the full Monty, whatever they should get for that leg. But because they're they're tipping a little bit and their weight shifts because of that leg and the amputation, maybe it affects their knee or their hip or ankle or all three. And so you may have a secondary condition in that context and the other uh, other side, you know, and then in that situation you know if you don't if you don't claim it the right way uh then you you may end up getting denied so i've seen seen examples like that where it's not written down right or just uh i mean the best example is basically a guy that goes in uh, you know the tbi is the most common where the 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 effect of the TBI is just not fully addressed by the VSO because all they do is they put traumatic brain injury and then they send you in. And so they frequently don't flush out all the details. So you go in and hopefully you get a doctor that's decent. Oftentimes you don't. And so they don't take a good history and the veteran comes out with a 0% rating on TBI when they should be 70, which is a huge difference. Well, it's funny you bring that up because, um, so in the IED explosions that I experienced, I didn't get service connected for TBI. They lumped that in with uh, my PTSD and they lumped together my TBI, PTSD and depression all into one condition. And I forget what they called it, or maybe they called it all three, but gave it all one rating together. Mm. Um, didn't, <laughs> doesn't seem right, but of course, I don't know. So maybe this is a situation where I need to uh, to look up the services, old Benjamin Krause Esquire, and and uh, and have you look at it. I don't know. And and so here's the thing. This is exactly why this conversation is important because when I got my rating, I was like, "Well, this seems like bullshit to me," but I'm not gonna. I don't. I'm not gonna. All right, whatever. I got 90%. Cool, whatever. I'll roll with it. Mm. Right. Um, and I think a lot of veterans do that with wh whatever they get, 30%, 20%. And they just don't feel like they want to deal with the hassle of dealing with the VA. Um, <clears throat> well, so wh what does it, what does, <clears throat> what does it cost a guy or a gal to, to have you dig into their case? Uh, assuming that they win it or well, that you win it for them or they win it to however you phrase that, uh, because I think that might be a hurdle for people, right? They don't mm -hmm. want to, they don't want to, uh, hire a, a guy like you because it's going to cost them something and it shouldn't because they're veterans. So they shouldn't have to pay for this service, but yet they're okay with having mediocre care or a mediocre rating or whatever. All right. So let me answer that in two ways. So, uh, sorry, I was. I no, flattering. that's. I mean, that's that's how it is. So first of all, uh, what you're talking about is a very frequent thing that the VA does. I think it's you know BS how they do it, but frequently what they try to do is uh, they'll merge claims like PTSD and TBI together, or depression and TBI, because some of the symptoms might be similar. Yeah, uh, and then they claim, well, we can't differentiate between these two things, so therefore we're going to put them together, you know, and because otherwise it's speculation. Well, there are a couple problems with that uh, rationale. The first is that when it comes to the VA and something similar to, like that, the VA has a responsibility kind of a, uh, to, to find in favor of the claimant and to also maximize your benefits. And so what the VA does in those contexts is that they usually ma they combine it and then the veteran almost always ends up with a lower rating than what they would have done if they could have otherwise split apart those symptoms and allocated the symptoms that are probably most likely connected with TBI as a TBI rating, and then depression or PTSD as a separate rating. And so oftentimes what they'll do is they'll give you a combined rating of like 50%, when really you could easily have 50% for PTSD or depression, 
and then potentially 70% because you have uh, objective evidence of a moderate traumatic brain injury residuals, for example, and that's 70% over here, you know, a totally separate thing. And that'll pop a lot of veterans up over to 100%. And then you're 100% permanent total. You get out of the, the, the hamster wheel of the VA bringing you back in all the time for, for ratings and, and whatever to keep assessing your PTSD over and over again because it's really a complicated thing that they can frequently split apart. But what we're seeing in the field, and this is you know one of the scandals that I exposed with the Department of Veterans Affairs back in 2014 through uh, broadcast media, it became an IEG scandal and everything else, uh, was the VA was uh, hiring and using unqualified doctors and nurses to assess traumatic brain injury. Most people appreciate that a traumatic brain injury is a very complicated neuropsychiatric situation and therefore requires very complicated uh, testing and diagnostics to figure out the effect of. But what they were doing is hiring nurse practitioners and like family practice doctors, people like that, which is akin to what I was talking about before with go to Valvoline versus a transmission, you know, a uh, person like each shop is going to have its unique thing, yeah. but I wouldn't want somebody changing my oil over here, also working on my transmission over here. And so that's the VA. What the VA did is like that. Nah, we're going to go Valvoline all the time. So we're bringing Valvoline in here. We don't care what the issue is. And so, uh, so that's been kind of the background. And and when we exposed that scandal, there were uh, around twenty five thousand veterans affected from twenty ten to at that point in time, I think it was twenty fifteen. And they issued an equitable relief uh, uh, proposal, and veterans were the ones that were affected were notified supposedly by the VA and had the opportunity to get you know their their claims fixed, but uh, but now they've done essentially the same thing to get around it. They just hired contractors now, so the contractors are accountable, but not in the same way. And so the contractors, as I understand it, are doing similar, where they're using again nurse practitioners and other folks to do these assessments. And because they're not uh, VA employees directly, they can't, Congress can't bring them in for accountability in the same way. So the agency is in many ways passing the buck again. This time they're just using contractors to do the dirty work instead of uh, uh, their own employees, which were doing it before. Now to, to your other question about, you know, how much does it cost to hire an attorney or me? I work, I do not work on Minnesota cases for pay. And I'm happy to explain why that is. Uh, in a second, but uh, but if you want to hire me, I'm going to charge uh, basically market. You know, there are, there are exceptions where I charge uh, pro bono or low bono, and then otherwise, you know, normal. You know, whatever normal is uh, anymore. But if you're to hire an attorney like me, who's a, a 10 year plus attorney with other background experience, and if you were to hire me or any other attorney with 10 years to go handle like a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit. At uh, in DC uh, at the district court there, uh, our hourly I think mine is right now pegged at five fifty or something like that an hour if I'm doing hourly which I really don't do uh, frequently but that's what my hourly is if any ten year attorney not just me that's just what it is set you know yeah. it's one of the DOJ I can't remember the name of the uh, scale but that's you know just what it is um, what I do right now just as an example uh, I'll ha ha work on cases. Pro bono, meaning free. I don't charge uh, for every veteran. Uh, there are cases where I'll work on it, like uh, terminally ill veterans, veterans that are trying to get what's called independent living uh, benefits from the Veteran Readiness and Employment Program. I'll help them out uh, without pay. Uh, when it comes to compensation pension, and not just me, but just people in the field, usually the rate is between, if you pay, 20 to 33 and a third percent of whatever's recovered in the back pay. And that's generally how it is. It's not always how I do it, but uh, but that's just kind of the general thing. I don't charge 33 and a third, but um, it just depends, you know, on what's going on. You usually shouldn't charge 33 and a third or like above that, I should say, uh, because then the Department of Veterans Affairs will assume that your uh, fee arrangement is uh, not reasonable. And so then you'll have to justify why you charge more there are examples where you might be able to do that, and it's probably fine. But at the end of the day, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Board of Veterans Appeals has a jurisdiction over your fee agreements. You send all your fee agreements to, to the VA, to the uh, Office of General Counsel or to the regional office, and they have jurisdiction over it. So any, any fee agreement I have, I send to the federal government to uh, verify, and I can't charge a veteran until I've done that. 
the uh, I think so. I think that answers that question. The wow. uh, yeah. So go, I haven't, go I haven't been able to say. I don't even remember what my questions were. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, there's it's it's a ton of information. It's you know, and I think we all know the VA does everything that it can do. And you know, sadly, that valvoline treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, not sadly, I guess, but fortunately, that does cover. A lot of veterans that come through the door right you know not everybody needs that specialty care and it's it's just good to know that you know if you or or somebody you know has been in a situation where things didn't work out right that there are people like ben out there that can help them out um because a lot of times as veterans we kind of feel like we're out in that raft all by ourselves you know and uh it, it's nice to know that the community is there um it's nice to know with ben being a disabled veteran um you, you're kind of you're you're one of us you know what I mean? I mean, not just just in this group, but in the context. I'm almost a regular guy, folks. Right? Almost. Almost. Uh, almost. <laughs> almost. You got a little growing to do. A little bit. <laughs> you know, I, th I think that's I think that's a huge piece of that storyline because mm -hmm. I I know you know it's it's difficult as veterans to reach out and ask for help. You know, we we always think we're crushing it, and we're being crushed by it. Mm. You know, and I yeah. I mean I hell. In the last year and a half, I've been in a situation like that, just coming out of it right now. Thought everything was great, and it wasn't. You know, so it happens to everybody. And uh, just to know that you can actually have a, you know, a battle buddy uh, as an attorney mm -hmm. that that can that can go to bat for you or at least answer your questions because a lot of time it's that gray area. It's the what ifs, what did happen, what didn't happen, um, that eat at you. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't allow you to go to sleep well. And they change everything. So yeah, I think it's awesome. Well, I think that, um, and, and Ben, I mean absolutely zero disrespect by this, mm -hmm. but I think it's absolutely effing ridiculous that people like you need to exist. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when I say that, I mean that it's 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 ridiculous that veterans need to fight that hard mm -hmm. to get the things that they've earned. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad that you are doing the work that you're doing because I believe that it's helpful. Uh, but I think it is an absolute travesty and a breakdown of the system that promised us, the three of us sitting in this room and millions of more were promised better treatment. We were promised better things from the government that we chose to protect. And all three of us are fighting the VA or have fought the VA for shit that we've earned. Um, and so it's a travesty that you have to exist in that capacity. Right. Um, but I'm glad that you're here. You, yeah. Does that make sense? No, hundred like, percent. I don't, I don't no, mean no, to, so I don't like, want to spend really. 30 seconds wait, wait. destroying your, no, your dude, profession. So here's <laughs> the thing, you know, and I've, I've said this before to other folks, even before I went to law school, but so I created a website called disabledveterans.org back in the day, right? Before I went to law school, created a, a Facebook group too, because I, you know, I'm a lifetime member of disabled American veterans, right? And they wanted to talk to me about my, my voc rehab experience because they paid for my undergrad to go to Northwestern at the time, right? So I got this economics degree from a, you know, a pretty hoity-toity university and had a good experience. And uh, they wanted to talk about it, but the second I started talking about how voc rehab stiffed my emergency room bills, or things like that, and they stuck me with a five thousand dollar ER bill. Suddenly, DAV was not interested in my story anymore. Weird, weird, weird. You know, disconfirming evidence, and they all of a sudden were just didn't want to talk about it anymore, and they ghosted me after that point. So I created this Facebook group. Now we have over forty thousand veterans there, and we're talking about voc rehab benefits. You know, veteran readiness and employment benefits, where veterans want to become doctors, lawyers, own a business. You know, they want to do whatever, be a contractor, whatever, whatever the thing is. They go there to get feedback from other vets, you know, or, or, you know, me, if I'm, if I'm around. And so that's been something we've kept going for the past, you know, almost 15 years now, I think, give or take. And, you know, writing about these experiences on disabledveterans.org and, and, you know, pumping that narrative. But to your point about it's too bad that, you know, we need to hire attorneys. I agree. You know, here's the thing. I would love to be earning a thousand dollars an hour, being a, a high-profile Wall Street attorney, making big bucks. Yeah, absolutely. You know, because if I could make double for all the oxygen I already breathe anyway, why wouldn't I do that? <laughs> right. yeah. You know, and I'll tell you, the lots, a lot less headaches, right? Because you're a big, big shot Wall Street attorney with white shoes. You know, so I mean, that's that's good stuff. But you know, do they? Hold not, on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> do they wear white shoes? White shoe boys. 
is what they call a lot of the you know attorneys and other lobbyists and whatnot that deal with Wall Street. I'd like you a whole lot less if you wore white shoes. I'm not white. Suit. Oh, I ain't doing it. Okay, good. I, I know you got you. some white shoes. Though. I've seen them. Yeah, but they're tennis shoes. They're not <laughs> very white. They're, they're not. White. They're not white wing tips. <laughs> Those sneakers are, are super white. white. They're <laughs> shiny. Yeah, but yeah well, dude. Like I agree. You know, veterans shouldn't need to do this. You know, a veteran. You know, what I bring to the table and other attorneys is that we work with experts. So if you run into a problem with that Valvoline, you know, Voc or Valvoline VA examiner or whoever it is. Uh, we bring in a big hitter expert to come in and knock that opinion out. Well, that's thousands of dollars just for the opinion, just to have a, a pro doctor, psychiatrist come in to do that. But that's what it takes. That's part of what you don't necessarily get from a VSO, not at least not normally, because they either don't have the budget for it or they just don't know how to work with experts. You know, it's yeah. just not what they're trained to do. Uh, and that's fine. That's what attorneys are trained to do. That's why I went to law school. But I think that, you know, I've told the VA multiple times, I'm like, look, approve veterans for these law school benefits that you're denying or to be doctors or for, you know, these TBI claims, put me out of business, you know, educate yeah. veterans on the front end and Good how call. the hell to do it right. to begin with. And they won't. I wrote a book about voc rehab benefits and I'm like, look, just, you can take my book, license it, give it to every veteran you want. You know, instead they would rather pay a company like Booz Allen Hamilton, $36,000 to go make a 16 page PDF about the winter games. Doesn't teach anybody anything other than, you know, some people doing winter games, I guess maybe that's the winter game, like winter if, push hands. If that's your thing, you know, I don't know, but yeah, I'm not sure, but that's what they pay, you know, 30, 50,000 for a PDF of pictures wow. of veterans doing some stuff. It doesn't tell anybody how to actually get their benefits. Right. It's always been a mystery and I've always wondered why the, the federal government has such a problem just giving veterans what they earned. Why is it such a fuck battle? Mm. Right. Excuse my language. Why is it such a battle? Just, just give them what they earned. Well, I remember that comedian I uh, shared with you that clip. You know, what was the biggest, uh, what's the biggest sham that the government has, has pulled? What's the biggest hoax? And uh, that comedian's response was the fact that they realized it was easier to make veterans heroes than it is to take care of them. Yeah, you know, and that's and that's a tough mm -hmm. thing. And I, I thought it was funny coming from a from a comedian to mm -hmm. to be saying that, and it got a hell of a lot of laughs. I mean, it's really funny, um, but it happens to affect people like us. And then you have you have other people out there <clears> saying, <throat> "Well, you know, these benefits are so expensive, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, there's just a bunch of people out there milking the system." Are otherwise capable, um, you know. I don't think I, I won't speak for the three or for the other two of you in this room. But if I were able to trade the issues that I deal with every day, I'd trade them right now. Yeah, there won't be a question. About I'd give it, every I dime back. And yeah. I don't. And I don't think there's many veterans that would be in the situation where they would say, "You know what? I I really like that modest amount of money." You know, mm. and I'm, you know, with all the problems that come along with with these issues and, mm -hmm. and the compensatory rates are they're fine they you know they help bridge that gap but you know your quality of life is everything i mean we all talk about if you don't have your health you don't have anything mm -hmm. well yeah it doesn't matter how much money the va pays me if i can't if i can't do anything with it and you're right a thousand percent i would give every dime back to to avoid the situation where uh, my wife, who is 16 years older than I, needs to help me out of bed. Right. Uh, it's demeaning, in my opinion. It's demeaning. It's embarrassing. It doesn't make me feel like a real big, tough guy when my little tiny wife has to help me out of bed because I can't f move in the morning. I, says, I did it again. God dang it. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, but... <laughs> He just but, wants to test out that bleep of bleep. Bleep that he worked out last week. <laughs> nice. But, but I'd give it all back yeah. in, a, in a heartbeat. Uh, but what I would not give up and what I would not give back is my service. Mm -hmm. I would not give up that experience. Mm -hmm. I would not give up the relationships. I would not give up the, the places I've been and the things that I've done uh, to me make the having my wife help me out of bed worth it. Mm. Right. Uh, because I've met some amazing people and done some amazing things and had a hell of a time. But it ain't about the money. 
I can assure you that. And nobody, folks, just to clear the air, there is very few, if any, veterans who are fighting to collect VA benefits because they're going to be rich. And that, that, that is not the game. Um, to keep us in the finest diapers. Yeah, right? <laughs> I want velvet pampers. I do. I, I, want, the, I want the royal purple mm. adult pull-ups. Um, and as you can tell, I was very specific there, so I just let the cat out I'm of the bag. I'm curious <laughs> about that. It seems like you've already bought them. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. might have a stockpile. <laughs> ben, do you see a lot of... Um, do you see a lot of a lot of veterans getting denied for benefits that should be like a, a open and shut deal? Like, I, I guess my question is: Do a lot of guys and gals get denied benefits where it seems like it's should be a no brainer, almost like they're protecting it? Yeah, like, uh, we don't know if you're able to be in this club where we can pay you money and provide you medical care. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, you know how like in the army, there's mm. badge protectors. You know, like those guys right, when we right, did right. the expert infantry course, they're like, "Oh, I don't know, I don't know. Your your boot laces were a quarter inch too long, so you're disqualified." Well, and I think the follow on would be to that, just it, in the same mm -hmm. question, but kind of tightening it down, because you know, if there's people out there that are that are nine eleven post mm -hmm. veterans, you know, it's it's the Pact Act, right? Yeah. And so it was all these issues, and it was, it was probably those harder to crack cases where, you know, in early 2005, after the first and second wave were coming back, and these respiratory issues were, you know, manifesting and they were starting to come through. And there really wasn't anything at the VA that said specifically what this thing was, you know, kind of like the, uh, you know, Agent Orange coming out of the Vietnam conflict, right? And so, you know, did you see uh, an uptick in? clients reaching out to you particularly about undiagnosed issues that maybe then resolved with PACT Act? Uh, uh, okay, so PACT, so that's the PACT Act uh, is still really being flushed out, you yep. know? So people are starting to maybe, uh, I just came back from a, a, a veteran legal clinic out in Washington, D.C. And people are still coming to appreciate what the PACT Act can and can't do. But what we're noticing generally is that um, there are certain respiratory, so like the Department of Veterans Affairs is, is uh, rewriting a lot of their disability uh, criteria. And what we're seeing is a combination of things where the agency is uh, mo hiding the ball a little bit. So they're, they're attributing some claims to PACT Act when they shouldn't. And then other claims that they shouldn't, they do. And so, they kind of cross swords, so to speak, uh, you know, and it confuses cases uh, frequently. What we're seeing, uh, respiratory cases are, are challenging. Uh, sleep apnea is probably the one where you almost, you don't always need to get an expert, but frequently you do. Even if, even with PACT Act, you would think with the uh, sinusitis and allergic rhinitis presumptive, you know, you get those and, and it pops, well then, Usually, that should lead to a sleep apnea uh, secondary service connection, uh, or even direct, depending on you know whether it was documented in service. And so, but you're still having to fight that even when it's obvious. And they, the agency, again, the respiratory stuff is pretty pretty challenging. The uh, they'll give, they give you kind of a sometimes maybe a low ball, and just you know again they usually hit. I would say right now 80, 90 percent. And they'll inch you up in that way and expect you to, in, in my opinion, go away. That's kind of the uh, administrative effect of those decisions and assume that you're just not going to push further. Uh, and most times the veterans won't. I know when I uh, hit 40%, I remember going back to DAV at that time and asked about my other conditions. And DAV uh, was like, well, are, are you not happy with 40%? And I kind of looked at it and was a little confused. And... Uh, you know, came back later to a different person because DAV controls who you talk to based on your social security number. So if you have a certain social security number that ends a certain way, you can only talk to Bob. And if it has different back, you know, different numbers, you talk to Eddie over here, you know, and you may not get the best one. You always get stuck with whoever. So I figured out 
how to do that, which is wait for that one dude to be gone that day and go in and then end up with the better guy, right? And so <laughs> ended up with the better guy. I brought in my evidence. Uh, and that's what, you know, turned the needle and, and into what I currently am rated at. But, you know, I had to go to the right guy. And just the other dude didn't care uh, uh, about it. Well, you're happy. Good enough. You got other veterans over here. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that I got some other things going on. And and I'm pretty sure that this, you know, fits over here, you know, because I read and I read what the decision said and it wasn't right. And that guy just didn't care. So the veteran who knows how to read. Yeah. Right. They're not banking on that. Yeah, it, right. it only it only took me three tries or four tries at that point. So you know, <laughs> and I had to have a college degree. Finally, I started reading uh, my decisions. So that's kind of how that worked. Well, yeah, and it's I, I think a bigger part of that too is that rating decision. Yeah, it's important to see the percentage, but you know we have these other issues, mm-hmm. right? And you know if you if you don't pursue those and get that service connection, even if it's at zero. Yep. Um, down the pike, I mean, you're gonna have, there's gonna be other things. It's not like the PACT Act was the only thing that's gonna happen out of this 20 year conflict. Right. Right. There's well, gonna be more. Right. The uh, the big example like that is a traumatic brain injury. So uh, depending on the hospital, you may not get the special care for TBI unless you have a disability rating for it. Now you can have a TBI in your record, but if it's not service connected, you're not gonna get the special care. You're going to get the other stuff, whatever that is. What does that look like? Well, so you're not going to get certain types of care within the polytrauma clinic frequently. You're going to get, you know, uh, some Motrin. And, you know, you're going to get some psych meds. They're going to treat you with PTSD. Great. When you may be suffering from traumatic brain injury residuals, and they just won't address it. And it doesn't matter how many times they're, they're following protocol within their system that you don't know. And you're getting half baked uh, health care. So you don't even know that because your disability benefits don't say X, when you go to get health care, you're thinking you're getting what you're supposed to get. You don't realize, oh, you're not getting the special stuff. You're getting regular mustard, not the gray poupon. But they're telling you that you're getting the best stuff. Okay. Well, not even that. It's it's the best versus what, what they've diagnosed you with and what they're connecting you to. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's not it's not as if those doctors or the nursing staff are going to be downgrading your medicine. Mm-hmm. It's just because a, a bureaucrat raider went mm-hmm. through and chose what side of the fence you're on. Right. And if it doesn't truly reflect your issues, you know, you're, you're not going to do it. It's like somebody who has um, allergies and your allergies can manifest internally or externally. Mm-hmm. Well, those are two different medicines that you take, I believe. And there's different topical treatments, et cetera, so on and so forth. But it kind of sounds like that type of a situation where mm-hmm. if you don't have or if you don't take the time to go through it and understand the specific nature of your of your issue, when you go in to get treatment, you, you're probably not getting what you need. Not the thing that's going to make you better. Right. Well, and, and if you're a veteran with a TBI, sometimes they'll give you uh, psychotropics that may actually be con- what's called contraindicated, meaning you shouldn't get it if you have a TBI or if you have some other kind of thing because it will cause you to become psychotic and Great. Maybe have hallucinations or become suicidal or these other things, right? But they'll give you the, 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 the psychotropics uh, that relate to PTSD because according to their records, you're only entitled to the PTSD side of the thing, not the TBI <clears throat> side of the thing. Who, who makes all of this shit up? Who's the one that says, well, you don't have a, a, a TBI on a level that allows you the good care. You're going to get the middle grade care because your TBI is worse than whatever this metric is. Who makes that? Who Who's the one writing this? Well, right now it's, it's you know, the contractors, right? It's not really even the VA frequently. Usually it's whoever creates the policy manuals inside in-house. So sometimes, like, I want to say it's Booz Allen Hamilton, but I might be mistaken, that uh, helped create the calculators that the VA uses, right? So it's not even the VA stuff. And so these these contractors will come in, and, and many of them are good, but, you know, the effect of this on the administrative process could be bad. But are these people doctors? Oftentimes, the people that create the policies are not. They're usually bean counters or policy analysts. So how is some, per- that'd be like me going into this office and going, okay, well, show me 10 TBI cases and I'll tell you which of the five deserve a higher tier of care. Yeah. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I'm not a doctor. Yeah. And who collected the data that they're reading? You know, even mm-hmm. if you did have a doctor, if you don't have, you know, 
protocol to get mm. through a point if you're not going through the exact same thing. It's it's a reason that I, I think you're mentioning you have to hire these professionals to bring them in. Yeah. Um, you know, to get somebody to look at it the right way. Okay, but so, the, here's my frustration. Know, it's fraught man. with oddities. Um let's say for conversation's sake, uh should I, I turn this light back on? Not the no, you're either. good. You're good. Okay. Um, I work. I'm working for you. For you, Jason, on a construction site. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're fired. <laughs> and I <laughs> and I do, <laughs> and I do an old Todd, and uh, I'm filling a generator with a lit cigarette, and that cigarette ignites the fuel in the generator, and I get a TBI from the explosion. Where am I going to go for care? Probably a, a, a head a trauma unit, right? Somebody that that deals in brain injury, you know, whatever, or I fall off a track or onto my beam, right? I'm going to go somewhere and get and get medical advice and treatment from somebody that specializes in this. Well, where in the hell does the VA come off doing whatever the hell it is that they're doing and sending me to some beam counter or some medical assistant who's writing some bullshit? about how to take care of my TBI. And they had no idea what the hell they're talking about. And this is okay. This is how we treat the men and women that have chosen to serve this country. And then people go, oh, well, you know, they're getting something. It's better than nothing. They're getting better treatment than the homeless. Who gives a shit what the homeless are getting? They're homeless. Like They deserve to have something. Yes, they need help. But they don't need help more than veterans need help. So why the hell would we, why wouldn't we, why wouldn't we send our veterans to specialty centers and to doctors that specialize in these conditions instead of saying, well, we don't think that your condition is bad enough for top tier care. We're going to give you middle grade care. What the hell is that all about? And, and, and didn't they promise to take care of veterans, the ones who, who chose to, to bear the burden of this country on their backs? I just, I don't, I have a really hard time understanding. And I'm no doctor. Maybe somebody out there is going to call me an idiot for, for my rant. But <clears throat> if a really simple guy like me can see it, super smart people got to see it too, right? You would think. I would think that. I don't know. What 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 do you guys think? I don't know. Well, I, do I have a phallus growing out of my face? First of all, yes, yes, you do. Yes. Oh. Definitely after tonight. You have a phallus. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Hi, Judy. So, <laughs> <laughs> but here's the deal, man. This all comes back. Well, what is it called? Bureau of War Risk Insurance. And then, you know, then they slapped a new label on it. Yeah, a lot of the policies come from this era, and they made some tweaks and modifications over the years, but really it comes back to the Bureau of War Risk Insurance. What is it? You know, it's like renaming the Department of Defense from the Department of War, right? What does it really do? Well, it's Department of War, you know, but okay, we're going to call it defense because it sounds better. And the Bureau of War Risk Insurance, what does that make you think? Uh, It makes me think I'm treating veterans like uh, they're an insurance client and not like something making a, appear like we're giving them access and appear like we're, you know, helping them to the fullest extent that we can. But really what they're doing is they're, they're jamming us into this insurance model that happens to have some doctors. Hopefully you actually meet a doctor, but usually you don't. And aside from that, you know, what, what is it? They're trying to keep the cost of war down so we can justify more war. What a great deal, right? And we've been doing it for decades. And that's, that's, the, that's the game, you know? It's a big insurance company. They make it look like they're taking care of vets, and, and usually they are. But when you're one of the ones that aren't and you squawk, they try to squash you like a bug. And those are the folks that I usually help. It's the folks that they'll go to the senator, they'll go to the congressperson, they'll try to get a hold of the White House. Nobody helps. They get and, no answers. And they're getting screwed. And they get no answers. Or what I like more is when the VA behind the scenes will talk smack about the veteran, the disabled person trying to get help, to try to stigmatize and marginalize them so then the senator or the congressperson won't help them. And I see that a lot. Mm. Well, not just here in Minnesota, we see it you know, in D.C., elsewhere. It's, it's a very common move where they try to poison the well 
besmirch somebody behind their back and then, oh, well, they're just a crazy vet. Yeah, they're disabled. You know, what do you, why do you keep trying to think a veteran's going to act like a non-disabled person when they're effing disabled? That's the whole point. But then because you act like you are, which is disabled, suddenly we're going to treat you like scum or then you're, Yeah, then you're, then you're, you're, um, you're digging for stuff you don't deserve. You know what? We are effing crazy. Because this shit makes you crazy. Trying to figure out how to navigate this system so that I can live out the rest of my days in peace makes me crazy. Because I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. I don't want to fight with these people. I don't want to go to this piss-smelling building and then have to navigate through a bunch of idiots that don't know how to help me because they read about what I go through in an effing book, maybe. Yeah. I'm crazy. I'm crazy because you made me that way. Maybe not all the way. <laughs> there might be some crazy that I, that, I, that I got on my own. But you, United States of America, go the government, you tore me down to the studs and you rebuilt me in, my, in your image. And if now I'm crazy... You had a huge hand to play in it. But you know what? My crazy was just fine when I was on the roof of a Humvee behind a machine gun looking for IEDs and defending, uh, defending trucks full of effing styrofoam to go plates. My crazy was good then. People told us all the time, man, you guys are crazy. Do you know what's in those trucks? Yeah, to go plates. So that you don't have to eat chow in the chow hall. You can take it back to your room and be a recluse if you want. Yeah, that's crazy. But you know what? We loved it. Because that was our part. That's the part we played. That's the mission we were given. It wasn't always to go plates. We had Burger King once. <laughs> we had Burger King trailers. But we had fuel and construction materials. We had all kinds of stuff. But don't label me crazy and then call me a shitbag when I walk out the door. Because you, you made me that way. And I, and I allowed it. And I had a hell of a time doing it. And I think, all, I think all that we ask for is just some more simplicity. Why does it have to be so difficult? Why does it have to be so effing hard to just be able to be comfortable and as healthy as we can be, whatever that means anymore? Why can't we just do that? Why do we got to fight? I agree with you, Ben. Why don't we work you right out of an effing job? Mm -hmm. And then Ben can wash boats. He likes to wash boats. Dude, I'd love to wash me a boat. See? Yeah. I don't think he can make a thousand bucks an hour doing it. No. So. No. But if he's fun. worked out of the job, he won't have to worry about it. I, I want him to go get those white shoes because then we got a cool place we can go hang out at. <laughs> I mean, I just, I'm, I'm already making plans. I can you wash I mean. boats in white shoes? I don't know. A I'll thousand try. bucks an hour. You I think mean, he's washing you know. his own boat? <laughs> no, ben. ben's boat right pretty now. eccentric. I think he would. I don't think so. Yeah. He takes good care of his stuff. You know, wax on, wax off. Yeah, yeah. Right? Miyagi. Right? Um, is that wrong? All right, no. fellas. Uh, <laughs> no. We're running we're running short on time. We gotta we have to end this fiasco. And I'm sorry, I went on like a two minute rant and I spit all over my microphone here. Um, so this is the part of the show that I really like to do. Uh, we're gonna do final thoughts. Oh uh, ben, you're the guest, so look into the camera. And take about 30 seconds and just give your final thoughts about the conversation. What do you think was good? And what do you want people to know moving forward? Veterans are getting screwed. Let's be honest. It's time to educate vets about what to do, how to get their benefits so they don't, they're don't they not beholden to VSOs or attorneys or the VA. Give them the tools. Be transparent. Get real. You know, If you're going to spend all that money on contractors, just all the crap, have the contractors just make books to educate them about the benefits so at least they can go get them themselves, right? Right now what we have are these beholden like institutions where the secret knowledge is with the VSOs or with the attorneys or within the VA itself, and they, and they don't educate vets about what to do. The information's not out there. They'll give you little bits and pieces of this or that, but they don't give you a way to get the stuff that you're, you're entitled to. They just don't. They don't want you to know. 
And I think that's the biggest thing to take away. They really don't want you to know. They want you to be beholden to the other folks so they can control. And that's that's at the end of the day, I think that's what it's all about. There it is. Nailed it. He nailed it. Nailed it. Um, now, the best final thoughts of the day come from your boy, my boy, our boy, Mr. Jason Aus. Uh, Jason, 30 seconds. You're up. Go. I love you. Uh, I love you, too. So, I mean... I can't, I can't even follow up any of this veteran <laughs> business, you know, the, the advocacy talk after Benjamin Krause Esquire. So I'm not going to do it. My, my final takeaway is I hope that everybody has the same mental image that I have of Richie on that, on that Humvee, um, with a box of styro or with a trailer full of styrofoam to go plates. And in, in my mind, when the website is up and we are able I want to have a caricature of Richie behind a machine gun on the top of a mechanized styrofoam plate stack. And that is my final <laughs> thought. Nailed it. See, he nailed that one too. <laughs> okay. Um, very quick, because we're very close to out of time. Um, my takeaways for the conversation are, are this. Um, men and women all across this land have chosen to serve this country uh, many of them without question or hesitation. And then at the end of their service, get nothing but, but static and flack for it. The idea that benefits are so impossible to get, and I shouldn't say impossible, but it seems like they're near impossible to get unless you're willing to fight the fight, which I think is a big part of the problem. Veterans just lose steam. So having somebody like Ben to be able to fall back on, even if it costs you a little bit of money, um, it seems like a great idea. Uh, and not only that, but it puts a win. It puts a W in our column. And so if you are a person out there that is, is struggling with benefits um, or, or appeals or whatever that is, um, <clears throat> We're, we're going to put Ben's website and his info in the description below, so please make sure that you reach out to him, uh, even if you just have any questions. I'm sure between him and his staff, they'd love to answer those for you and get you down the road uh, to, a, to a, better, a better, more fruitful life. Uh, and this, this is why we're here. This is why Disgruntled's here. Uh, I'm sorry that I spit all over my microphone, uh, but I'll clean that up to, and be back with you next week to spit on it all over again. So make sure you join us. Have a great night.